welcome to Dialogue. Leaders of five Central Asian nations, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan will gather in Xi'an, China for the first China Central Asia Summit next week. Well, China is Central Asia's biggest trading partner. The region is a vital link in China's Belt and Road Initiative, a mega infrastructure umbrella going on its 10th anniversary this year. How can deeper and broader relations better benefit both sides? What are the implications of China's growing engagement with Central Asia? To answer these questions and more, I'm glad to be joined by Juma Odbaev, the former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, who just published a book by the title of Central Asia Economic Rebirth in the Shadow of the New Great Game. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qindu. Welcome to Dialogue, Mr. Odubayev. We know Chinese President Xi Jinping is to host a summit with leaders of the five Central Asian nations uh, on May 18th to 19th, the so-called C plus C5. Uh, tell us, you know, what's your understanding, you know, what are the, on the top agenda of this first uh, C plus C5 summit? There's a lot of expectations, a lot of good feelings that it will bring a lot of fruits for cooperation between Central Asian countries individually as a region with China, growing economic power of Asia. Uh, we already have uh, 31 years of diplomatic relationships between uh, all countries of Central Asia and China. Uh, and meanwhile, our economic political relationships achieved very high level. There is no problems in our uh, uh, political uh, relationships, economic ties growing quite quickly. Last year was a record year in uh, bilateral trade between Central Asia countries and China, which reached exceeded 70 billion US dollars, another 30 plus percent growth in comparison with the year earlier. The total volume of uh, Chinese foreign direct investments to Central Asia uh, exceeded $15 billion. Uh, but we're looking forward for more extended cooperation. We're looking forward to deepening our relationships, both in economics, in social matters, in humanitarian, in cultural, as well as uh, 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 in terms of people-to-people uh, uh, -people exchange. Uh, it's difficult to say what exactly will be in the summit, but already some information which we receiving from official in official statement show that it the the summit will bring very exciting and remarkable results. So the summit will be held in the historical city of Xi'an in northwestern part of China, where Xi'an uh, used to be the starting point of the ancient uh, Silk Road. Uh, so, Mr. Odubayev, tell us, uh, probably that's why Xi'an was chosen to hold the summit? Xi'an is a very special city uh, in terms of origination of the Great Silk Road, which started around 2,200 years ago during the Han Dynasty, when slowly, step by step, China uh, starting big trade with Europe. And uh, Central Asia suddenly became transferred itself from the landlocked to land-connected territory. Of course, everybody thinking that maybe now we can restore a new Silk Road in the new circumstances. So in that respect, uh, Xi'an is a special city for us, the oldest, old, old capital of China. And the fact that the summit, first inaugural summit will be uh, taking place in Xi'an is very special for us, very emotional uh, city for all Central Asians. Well, you mentioned about the relationship, you know, along the old Silk Road, let's say, you know, it's about, uh, goes back to more than 2,000 years ago. And now with this Belt and Road Initiative, it's the 10th uh, anniversary for this initiative. So I guess, you know, people uh, are looking forward to see the next stage of uh, BRI, you know, what's in there, both for China and uh, Central Asian nations? Yes, uh, it's not an uh, accident that uh, President Xi Jinping uh, 
made his uh, announcement about the uh, opening of the Belt and Road Initiative in the Astana in Kazakhstan exactly 10 years ago. And we also had a high expectation that this uh, initiative will bring a lot of fruits to our region. And then after 10 years exactly, we have this first uh, China to Central Asia summit. Uh, yes, during not only last uh, 10 years, but uh, over the last 30 years, uh, we established very fruitful relationships with China, uh, both political and economic relationships. We don't have any problems. We're building trust and economic activity growing very quickly. Uh, 30 years ago, our trade volume was uh, something like $700 million only. Now it's uh, $70 billion. So it's 100 times growth. But we have to adjust ourselves to new reality. We're really looking what happening in China in terms of modernization and moving into development model. And we don't want only to be on the side of this process. We, be, we have to be inside this process. So not only uh, purchasing hydrocarbon from our countries, but our participation in high quality moves of Chinese nation would be the great new ideas and how we have to uh, progress together in 21st century. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Adobayev, you, you obviously, you know, Central Asia seems, you know, is important to China and the, uh, the place to start this uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And also we see Chinese President Xi Jinping was in uh, Kazakhstan last year, uh, September. And then uh, earlier, uh, we have this foreign minister meeting. And then very soon, uh, so uh, we, we are going to have this uh, summit in China. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about, you know, China is also very important to Central Asian nations in terms of modernization, in terms of uh, industrialization and development. Uh, in what way, you know, uh, maybe uh, the Central Asian nations will benefit from China's uh, modernization process? Now, we are very excited that uh, in our borders we have the fastest growing economy of the world, uh, which has became very quickly within the last 40 years, economy number two in the world. So we're sharing the same Asian values. We have common border. There is no reason why shouldn't we uh, actively develop our different type of ties, political, economic, people to people exchange, whatever. So we have great expectations from for our future cooperation. It's not only a purchase of, of hydrocarbons, but also developing of our infrastructure. For example, energy infrastructure have to be developed. Uh, might be another line of gas delivery from Turkmenistan to China. Maybe some other pipeline delivering hydrocarbons to China from Kazakhstan, other countries. Uh, but also transport corridors. What is happening now is that we are in the middle of so-called uh, Eurasian uh, rail revolution. And what has happened last year that China, together with Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, decided to build a railroad uh, between these two, uh, between these three countries. And it will be another shortening of distance between China and Europe for another 800 kilometers. And trade through the rail delivery is booming. Uh, last year, between China and Europe, 16,000 train passed, which means that every hour there are two trains move to between Europe and China. And if distance will be shortened, then even current delivery time of 11 days between Chongqing and Duisburg could be cut for another day. So all these things would hopefully bring Central Asia to the situation when it will be transferred from landlocked region to land connected region. And then if the north uh, south uh, railroad uh, bridge will be developed, then Central Asia suddenly would become the transportation hub of Eurasian continent. And we, of course, looking forward to look back to the old Silk Road times when this 
bridge characteristic of our region brought us to the very high level of development. Mm, you mentioned about this uh, connectivity, you know, uh, with the physical connectivity, for example, uh, you know, like a middle corridor. Uh, tell us how important it is, you know, for the regional development and uh, what are the potential challenges probably we needed to overcome uh, to have such a kind of, uh, you know, middle corridor, probably economic corridor in this region? Yes. So what's happening now is that mainly 96% of the goods delivered between Europe and China move through so-called Northern Corridor. It means via Kazakhstan, Russian Federation, Belarus, Poland, uh, further to the uh, Western Europe. Uh, but what's happening uh, now is that mainly European forwarders and logisticians uh, wanted to explore a way of to get connected not crossing Russian territory. And uh, there is an idea of so-called middle corridor, which will be passing through Central Asia, crossing Caspian Sea, and moving through the South Caucasus to Turkey and further to Europe. It's even be shorter. The only bottleneck now is that all infrastructure have to be improved, including the transport uh, delivery of the trucks of the containers via Caspian Sea, which is still quite expensive. To transport one uh, 20 feet container through Caspian Sea costs another $2,000. But what's happening is that all countries involved working very hard to improve this middle corridor opportunities. There is a, another so-called Southern Corridor via, via Iran, which could also uh, connect Europe and uh, China, this is also possible. What is key for us, that all those corridors, including northern one, going through Central Asia. So we would become hub for delivery goods between Europe, China, and perhaps to the South Asia, to India, Pakistan, to the ports of Indian Ocean. This would be really a great breakthrough, and we hope that with Chinese knowledge of technology and railway communication, we really will have state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure project. Let's uh, focus a little bit on these uh, five nations here. Uh, you know, they uh, were born or reborn uh, out of this former Soviet Union. Um, you know, they hold similar positions on major international and regional issues. They have a uh, similarity, but also they are very different, you know, in, in their own way, in economic trajectory and, uh, you know, diplomatic relationship. You just wrote a book on, you know, Central Asia economic rebirth in the shadow of the new great game. Uh, tell us more, you know, what's the key message from your book on, you know, on this region and its future? Yeah, uh, my goal uh, by writing this book is to play S Central Asia uh, to the map of the world. Honestly, Central Asian economy is quite small. We, in our five countries, the population is 78 million people, and our gross domestic product, GDP, is uh, smaller than the GDP of such tiny cities like Singapore or Hong Kong. So we have to be very modest and working very hard, work very hard to increase capacity of our economy to bring interest from outside players, big countries, big powers to Central Asia, uh, including Western countries, Russia, and especially China, because China is really uh, uh, the most promising partner for us. So I wrote this book to say how, what potential Central Asia has, what history is have in surviving very difficult 30 years of uh, after disintegration of the Soviet Union. But Central Asia has big potential to be in transit, to be rich in natural resources. But also, that is what I want to underline, that in Central Asia, as a, a, a former legacy of the former Soviet Union, uh, we have highly educated population. So our people really willing not only to work on a simple industries, but to be part of the 21st century drive to the modern uh, modernization. 
And while China is also prioritizing modernization of her country, then we want to join this. We want to, our young, talented people must work together with Chinese counterparts to generate products of 21st century, really to move from simple industries to more sophisticated industry of 21st century. This is our ambitions. And our uh, leaders continuously saying these things to Chinese counterparts, not only supplying China with natural resources, but to be a source of talents, which together with other neighboring countries would generate product of 21st century, to be really generate more Nobel Prize laureates in China and Central Asia, to be innovative, one of innovative center on earth. Yeah, this is uh, very good because our talents currently are migrating somewhere else to Western countries. Yeah? So we have brain drain, but we have to get these young talents to work in our region. And in our region, we are lucky because China is selecting the way to modernize its economy as a flagship for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. High quality development. This is our goal. High quality development. Uh, at the same time, of course, we do see you know, countries like uh, you know, uh, Iran, the US, Russia, and of course, the European Union. They have interest in this region, and they are, uh, or some of them are showing increasing attention and uh, you know uh, participation or engagement with this region. So, how can you know s Central Asian nations you know make a good use of this uh, increasing interest uh, in dealings with uh, with those big powers, and so you know take advantage of their interests and develop this region. Yes, uh, I am uh, completely against of so-called zero-sum games. When somebody gaining, another one losing. No. Uh, what I know from my experience as a, a businessman, academic and politician is that all countries around Central Asia willing to have our, to see our region as prosperous, as dynamic and optimistic region, but not poor where poverty create mass migration or some maybe extremist, extreme, extremist elements, whatever. All countries around us wanted to see Central Asia as prosperous, looking forward region. So it's very natural cooperation should be with the countries around us. And in that respect, I would like to underline such institution as uh, potentially very influential Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, which will be growing very quickly in a summit in India uh, this summer. Uh, probably we will have new members of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. For example, I was very excited to hear that Saudi Arabia applied to be a member observer country in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So it means that uh, uh, this huge conglomerate already now where Iran will be next full member. We will have Arabic world, which will be joining us. Just again, our neighbor, and again within Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we could work together. And Central Asia, because of geography, right in the middle, right in the middle. And we still, and we want really to be as a hub of growing emerging Eurasia. Well, you, you, if you look, take a look, I mean, uh, Central Asia uh, does enjoy this advantage of, uh, let's say, the location, uh, geographic location, and also, uh, you know, as important a place for the initiatives like BRI and also uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, which is more or less based in this region. And, uh, and of course, you know, like uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Ting Gang said, uh, you know, this is the, the area, the region, for win-win cooperation and not for geopolitical contest. Uh, 
And if you look at the, as you pointed out, the relationship between Central Asia, Asia and China, there's no border disputes, no political disputes. It's, it's a smooth, it's, it's a, there's a good foundation for more cooperation in the area of trade, investment, and of course, modern, modernization, high quality development there. No, exactly. What, what is the key in all this uh, development is that we building step by step deep trust. It cannot be done overnight because we were cut off for many, many decades uh, with each other. So during these 30 years, we built trust. And as Confucius said famously, that if there is no trust, all talks are meaningless. So trust is here. So we have to go even deeper in our cooperation. Also, I would like to underline uh, to emphasize people-to-people -people exchange. This is very important that Chinese people will know better people from Central Asia and other way around. And in that respect, I was very excited to hear that most probably China and Kazakhstan will sign agreement on visa-free regime between these two countries. I cannot see the reason why other Central Asian countries cannot do the similar step. Uh, for example, Uzbekistan already announced that Chinese citizens can travel without visa to Uzbekistan. So in that respect, people will understand each other, will feel that they can be brothers, partners, colleagues, and then exchange with value, uh, with the goods, with ideas, visiting each other, seeing sightseeing, seeing nature, enjoying each other, learning languages, studying in each other universities, making joint research. Yeah? We are neighbors and we are neighbor with growing China, with this drive to high quality development and modernization. And we must be on the same boat. Well said, uh, you know, obviously, as you pointed out, you know, there's a, there is a report about uh, a 30 day uh, visa free travel uh, for citizens from China and Kazakhstan. Uh, there's a report that you know similar deals are probably in the making between China and Kyrgyzstan, your country. And of course, Turkmenistan you know, provides this convenience for Chinese uh, travelers too. So uh, hopefully, we are going to see you know closer uh, relationship between the countries, you know, between China and Central Asian countries, but also between the peoples. And that will result in probably more understanding and also probably more students, for example, studying in China or Chinese students studying uh, in countries in this region. And that probably will uh, produce more and uh, more positive outcome for both sides. Yes. Uh, now what I can see for sure that uh, more and more, especially young people, want to study Chinese language, more and more demand. We need to, for example, there is no reason why we can't open in the region Chinese universities yeah, where curriculum will be done in Chinese. They also should understand inside what's happening inside of Chinese citizen. What about history, great history of China? What about our historical connection? What we have to do in a new reality of 21st century? to move on and to accept each other's requests. Yeah? Listen to each other carefully and work together. This is our destiny. Without China, Central Asia will not develop as quick as it should. So you are suggesting like a Chinese universities that they can have uh, you know, campus in, in, in Central Asian nations? Yes, in Bishkek, in my city, we have uh, Kyrgyz Russian University, we have Kyrgyz Turkish University, we have Kyrgyz American University, all supported by respective countries. I don't see the reason why don't we have Kyrgyz Chinese University. So people to people, uh, bringing, uh, bringing good image of China to the region, very important. Not only by money, uh, by consumer goods, electronics, semiconductors, computers, television sets, but also bringing wisdom, wisdom, also bringing cultural values close to us, bringing, making exhibitions, 
making museums. For example, uh, famous Chinese poet Li Bai has been born in Kyrgyzstan. Why don't you build Li Bai's museum here? I am sure that uh, hundreds of thousands of Chinese tourists, maybe millions, would be coming here to look around. Definitely. Because he's so famous. So uh, oh, we have archaeological enormous uh, artifacts which uh, along the Great Silk Road which can be explored. So there is a, an enormous potential of our cooperation. So let's do it. Yeah, there's a lot to, to tap uh, in terms of the potential. Uh, you know, lastly, you know, there are some media have pointed out, you know, the absence of Russia in the summit, uh, upcoming summit. Uh, what do you make of that? You know, why do some people make a big fuss, a big deal of Russia's absence? Well, Russia is not a Central Asian nation, uh, you know, to be precise. No, no, it's exactly. What we want, uh, first of all, we want to be one unified, integrated region, our five countries. So we have different formats in a format of one plus five with United States, with Russia, with Japan, with Korea, and now with China. Especially in China, it's summits, it's, it's a top, high level uh, C1 plus C5. So Russia is not Central Asia and they are not jealous. Believe me, I know Russian very well. So they are willing that more Chinese investments coming here to Central Asia. Region will be growing, be more prosperous, be more promising market, more stable. No poverty, no extremism, no migration because of lack of jobs. Nobody wants Central Asia to be source of this uncertainty. So Russia is not Central Asia, as they don't ever ever thinking to be a Central Asia. Russia is a a great power as, as itself. Uh, that's one big. And we have good relationship with China, with, uh, with Russia. Because we, we shared the same country together only 31 years ago. Uh, so we, we have uh, understanding. Everybody in Central Asia speaks Russian language. There's a lot of exchange, a lot of migration, labor migration, whatever. So there is no reason why to speculate that uh, Russia is not president, so they, they must be worried. No, uh, Russia is not Central Asia. Well, on that note, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to Mr. Odbayev. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.